So let us create the overview of what we learned so far. We have talked about these three bones here, the scapula, the clavicle, and the humerus. Well, let's start again with the clavicle. The clavicle is an S-shaped long bone, and as you can see, it is horizontal. It is the only bone in your body that is actually horizontal. It has two ends, the sternal end because it articulates here with the sternum, and also the acromial end because it articulates here with the acromion of the scapula. On the upper surface, it is pretty much smooth. It doesn't have that many things to be explained, actually no things to be explained. And if we look from down below, we can spot something right here and that is the costal tuberosity. If we zoom out a little bit, we can see the subclavian groove for the subclavian muscle, or the subclavius muscle. And this here is the nutrient foramen. If we remove the scapula, we can also see here the coracoid tuberosity, which consists of the conoid tubercle and the trapezoid line. Here we can see the articular surface for the, for the acromion of the scapula, and here we can see the articular surface for the sternum. You can see that the sternal end is triangular. The body is also triangular, but it is harder to notice because the edges are somewhat rounded. Now let's start by explaining the scapula. Before we do that, actually, I just want to mention that this is the sternoclavicular joint, and this here is the acromioclavicular joint. Now let's start by explaining the scapula. The scapula is a flat bone, not a long bone, as the clavicle was. It has three angles. Here we can see the superior angle, the inferior angle, and also the lateral angle. Besides these three angles, it also has three margins. This is the superior margin, then we have the medial margin, and the lateral margin. It also has two surfaces. This what we see here is the dorsal surface. And on the opposite side, on the front, we can see the costal surface. The dorsal surface is divided in two by this elevation here called the spine. The spine actually divides the, the dorsal surface into the supraspinatus fossa because that's where the supraspinatus muscle originates, which we will see shortly. And also here is the infraspinatus fossa because that's where the infraspinatus muscle originates. It becomes more and more elevated and eventually ends up in a flat projection called the acromion. That's the acromion process. The opposite side is termed the costal surface, and it is creating this subscapular fossa because that's where the subscapularis muscle originates. It has these fine lines here for the tendinose insertions of the muscle. And then, if we start explaining a little bit more laterally what we have, we have to remove the humeral head, and here we can see the glenoid cavity. The glenoid cavity articulates with the head of the humerus, and above the glenoid cavity we can see the small superglenoid tubercle, and below the glenoid cavity we can see a larger infraglenoid tubercle. Not only that is interesting here, but we also have here the neck of the scapula, this constriction. And if we look 
over here, we can see this coracoid process with a very thick and strong base as it becomes more narrow as it goes outward. And over here, we can see the scapular notch. Now let's go back, let's bring back the humerus, and let's start by explaining the humerus. The humerus is a typical long bone. Its head, which creates the part of the glenohumeral joint, is quite cylindrical. And if we look down there, it also has a part in the elbow joint with the ulna and the radius. And if we go up a little bit, we can zoom in and let's explain the upper portion of the humerus. While this is the cylindrical head that articulates with the glenoid cavity of the scapula, this here is the anatomical neck. But the humerus has two necks. Another neck is the surgical neck, and that's where most of the fractures happen. Then it also has the minor tubercle and the major tubercle. Between these is the intertubercular groove, and the lips of that groove are formed by the crest of the major tubercle and the crest of the minor tubercle. As we zoom out a little bit, we can see here the nutrient foramen. And on the other side, opposite side, we can see the deltoid tuberosity for the deltoid muscle, which we will see shortly. And that tuberosity is bordered by this groove here for the radial nerve. The radial nerve because it's on the radial side of the humerus. Then we can zoom in a little bit more here and we can see the elbow joint. The elbow joint is basically a joint between the ulna, radius and humerus. This surface here which articulates with the ulna is called the trochlea. It has this median groove. This process of the ulna is called the coronoid process and that process when the arm is flexed is accommodated in the coronoid fossa. Then we have here this surface is called the capitulum. That's the surface that articulates with the head of the radius. The fossa above it is called the radial fossa. If we look from the back, we can see this very strong process, and that is the olecranon process of the ulna. And the olecranon fossa accommodates the olecranon process. This here is the lateral epicondyle, and this here is the medial epicondyle. The medial epicondyle has here the ulnar the groove for the ulnar nerve. And I'm sure everybody once in a while experienced that. When you have your elbow flexed and you strike it, it creates this shock-like sensation in your pinky finger and your fourth finger. And that's basically what's causing it. You strike the ulnar nerve in this place. And now we're finished with the overview of these three bones. Thank you. These lessons come as part of my software called Animated Anatomy that you can purchase on animatedanatomy.com or you can click here and subscribe for free lessons in the future.